go. Someone's alive. We are definitely still experimenting with a, a time that works best for everyone. So we've tried later than this. We've tried much earlier. This is sort of like somewhere in between the later than this so far through the biggest crowd. Um, so that's interesting. And will be noted. Oh, and uh, perhaps we should record. And, you know, there's a simple way to do this that I forget every time. Hey, Jack. I'm trying to figure out how to start a recording and I know it's easy and I keep forgetting how to do it. It's just like forward slash like and you can just pick. Oh yeah. Uh, uh let me do it real quick. Thank you. Now there. recording. Cool. Thanks. There it is. I was supposed to do that over in the chat. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right, I was just saying, um, thanks everyone for, for arriving. This is again, this is the third time we've moved this meeting. So I think we're still trying to find the right time for it, but I'm glad to see the coder guys here. Thanks for joining. Um, we have some updates to give uh, you all uh, based on the last call. Um, and uh, we'll we'll do that first. We'll just kind of like review uh, that and uh, hit you with our follow ups, um, and then we'll just kind of open it up to anything that uh, you all want to discuss. Um, but that's like how we'll start. So, um, so last week topics uh, there were two big ones. One was predominantly um, related to us talking about um, testnet maintenance for v0. Uh, now, now we will uh, moving forward. We'll just refer to it as Morse, the Morse release. Um, and uh, what we uh, what we talked about there was um, wanting to uh, eliminate single points of failure. Um, have more teams ultimately contribute to the running uh, of testnet and that the foundation would take some action to uh, solicit some more um, some more teams to help out. Um, the way we're going to do that, and I took that back to PNF, uh, we discussed with the directors, uh, and what will be published in another week or two uh, will be a new pop for uh, V0 testnet maintenance. And then anyone, including current teams that are involved, uh, are free to reapply to that. Um, and then, uh, and, and that's how we'll sort of get there. So there were some teams last week that uh, immediately reached out. Um, that's how we're going to do it, though. Let the whole like community have a shot. Um, and then there will be, uh, of course, a um, we will we'll figure out some math related to what the uh, stipend will be for maintaining uh, testnet nodes. The other thing to note as well is that uh, this will be a relatively uh, unique uh, pop uh, compared to the, some of the previous ones in that we would be looking to have multiple winners of it. Uh, we, we have had some valid feedback in the past that not all pops should be single winners. Uh, and this is a good example if we're if our goal here is to uh, reduce single points of failure and testnet, um, then yeah, we're going to be looking for 
for a few winners uh, for that. Yeah, awesome. All right. Uh, second, um, second topic last week had to do, or two weeks ago, had to do with um, clarifying um, uh, some of the rules around or expectations around uh, improvement proposals. So I don't remember who exactly had sort of called out that it was a little confusing right now, particularly around, um, you know, who gets to put up a proposal, um, how if you're a non-technical team, um, what does that mean, et cetera, et cetera. So again, directors are gonna, um, we're considering whether or not um, it will be a new PIP, clarify the PIPs, um, but there will be a, an update that will go out, but just to, just to kind of like set expectations here on this call for protocol, protocol category changes. Um, our expectation is that um, any any PIP would have a corresponding PR. And if your team is non-technical, but you have a great idea, that is what the community and the forum is for, is to solicit help. Uh, if you do need help writing something, you would reach out to, to several, you know, one of several teams that could help you facilitate that, um, you know, garner some buy-in to your idea and, and try to find some developers to help you out. Um, the expectation should not be that the core dev team will implement things that don't have a PR. Uh, and, and to build on that a little more, um, even how those are reviewed and when they may actually be integrated is up to essentially the PM and the dev, the core dev team on when they can slot things in based on the um, prioritization of what they're backlog looks like, what iteration they're in, um, other things that they may be working on that would be higher priority. Um, so um, so we just wanted to put that out there and we will put this into uh, a document uh, and update docs around all this so that it's crystal clear what the expectations uh, should be. Um, I hope that makes sense, uh, but yeah. That's how we would like to move forward there. Yeah, we don't want okay. to be in a position where uh, where a bunch of pets are basically derailing uh, core devs from shipping uh, the Shannon uh, spec. Um, ultimately, yeah, there has to be some prioritization from from uh, Mateo and and the rest of the core devs. Yep. Um, cool. That's a nice segue, Jack. Thanks for doing that. Uh, I, I, even though we are here focused on um, the Morse implementation, um, obviously people are interested in Shannon. Uh, I just want to call out that uh, you know one of the things that we continue to look at is the dashboard in GitHub. That's uh, the Morse dashboard. There is now a Shannon dashboard there as well. Uh, it has a roadmap associated with it, backlog, etc. You guys can see all the work that's going on in real time. You can see us pulling things into that repo and over onto that board. Um, it is uh, development is underway, and as is uh, a lot of the future iteration planning already, um, all the way up until early December, which is our milestone for a testnet uh, release. So uh, that is all happening uh, out in the open, uh, as you would expect from the team here. Um, and then the other thing we like to do in this meeting is if there are any new proposals, um, this should be a forum where we can talk about them. Um, there aren't at, uh, uh, at present. However, um, we do know that the coder team is working to split up uh, some of their previous proposals and potentially put them back up for individual consideration. Um, maybe uh, if you guys can speak to that, I'd be happy to uh, hand over the mic. Um, but if not, no, no worries. Um, we'll, we'll async it in the forum, but I, I, I'm, we're aware that that is underway and just wanted to point that out. Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. So the feedback we got for our uh, proposal were uh, two things were in one, 
and that kind of turned down people. Uh, they didn't want to uh, feel hostage and if they want one but not the other one, what do they do, right? Uh, so that was one feedback. Um, we want to split them up uh, and bring them uh, for individual uh, voting. Uh, before that, though, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is technical uh, with this new uh, PIP changes. Uh, is this still the right way to do? Um, you know, we, we split them up, uh, polish them up. Uh, there were some uh, questions. You know, we clarify those things, and then. Just like before, we uh, make a forum proposal, and after a few days, you go for a voting. Is this still the recommended way? So this technical question. The second one is going to be, uh, is there any feedback uh, that uh, people want us to implement, uh, especially for this uh, RTTM parameter, uh, relates to token multiplier uh, parameter? So let's start with the technical one. Um, is this still way to go? Um, and then we'll discuss the other one more at length, pro uh, probably. So the, the question was, uh, is it correct that you would split them up into new uh, pips and then put them up for a vote in a, after a few days? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, shall we do it that way? Just like we did uh, before. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, splitting them up into separate pips is the, is the correct way to go um, uh, for those uh, specific features. Um, we uh, I'll need to take a look at the uh, implementation section because in the past, um, all of our protocol upgrade pips have been uh, like grouped together with all of the features grouped together so the implementation has been pretty straightforward in terms of saying like yeah if this pip passes then uh then the the rc will be pushed and, and all that stuff um so i'll need to take a look to see if i can help sort of translate that into a, a world where we have uh, independent pips which may or may not pass um and then how that translates into like the development process um it should be pretty straightforward though um so yeah let's just move forward with separate pips um and uh and i'll and i'll, I'll follow up with you async about like maybe rewording the implementation to reflect the fact that there there may be multiple pips that are rolling into uh, a release cycle cool thank you uh, that answers my first question. The second one is um, really more <laughs> philosophical. Uh, is there anyone who voted no on our first proposal? And if so, of course, no hard feelings. Thank you very much for your uh, consideration and uh, you know caring about the network. Uh, what would it take for you to uh, change it to yes? Uh, what was the biggest uh, turn down for you? Uh, what do you want to see changed in new proposal? Um, and I'm especially asking this for the RTTM parameter. Coder, let's assume that maybe not right. everyone on the call is super familiar with the proposal. So maybe a high level TLDR of what of what what that was specifically, and and some of uh, maybe calling out some of the feedback that you got. Um, and then we can open it up for other people to comment if they if they have All good idea, Matteo, thank you. Uh, we had two proposals. Uh, I will start with the easier one. Uh, that is about more transparent uh, rewards sharing in the blockchain. Today, uh, if you have a non-custodial node and if you are using a node runner to run it, all the rewards go to that uh, output wallet address. and. Uh, the way to compensate uh, the node runner would be they calculate some sort of bill at the end of the week, at the end of the month, and uh, you have to remit the payments in, in terms of POCT, uh, uh, probably. But that's um, not the ideal way of uh, doing it uh, for two reasons. Um, one, you know, calculating the, that bill, sending to the customer, customer seeing it, uh, acting on it, sending funds the right amount to a certain address without making mistakes. It's just cumbersome. It is very slow, uh, less than ideal, right? 
our proposal, uh, sorry, the, the, the second part is, uh, once you sign the rewards, uh, how do you know customer is going to pay, right? If they have like a few notes, maybe that's not a big deal, but if they have a number of notes, uh, they own the output address, they own everything. So they can run with you for a few months, keep telling you that they, they are going to pay, but then they might disappear, take their uh, notes somewhere else and do it all over again. So there's this inherent trust that uh, that needs to be, but that's not really how the centralized uh, web should work, right? Uh, it should be trustless. So that's why we are uh, bringing this proposal, which is going to help uh, distribute the rewards uh, right in the blockchain. So for a given node, uh, you will be able to say, this output address gets this much rewards, uh, and this other output address is going to get that much rewards. Uh, it has multiple benefits. The uh, the rewards are distributed right on that block when they were awarded. Uh, so it eliminates all these trust issues and all the uh, cumbersome parts that comes later. Uh, and the second thing is it brings transparency uh, to the network. So uh, you can see how much you are really paying, how much the... Um, uh, the node runner really made if the calculations are indeed you know uh, correct because now it's being calculated by the network uh, itself and these two benefits actually help achieving an ulterior motive which is uh, with that now we can have more uh, non-custodial nodes uh, if you were having your nodes run professionally by a node runner uh, that was always a sticking point right uh, they either didn't support non-custodial at all, uh, or they had some sort of a fake non-custodial. Yeah, you know, they are marked as non-custodial, but the output address still belongs uh, to the uh, node runner. So it is really not uh, non-custodial at all, right? So that's the first proposal. Um, let's go step by step. Any feedback on this one? Any concerns? Any reason why this uh, shouldn't be implemented? And once, <laughs> uh, why did coder wait a year? Okay, hold on. I don't know what to say. It's you know we were busy with other things. Okay, so if there are any other feedback, uh, please let us know on the forum or you know, a direct message. Uh, you know, take your time. The second proposal, uh, it is a bit more controversial, and uh, it is called the uh, RTTM parameter, uh, Rewards to Token Multiplier. And here's a bit background. Today, Pocket Network sports uh, blockchain calls, right? Uh, it's all nice and good, uh, but if Pocket Network wants to do more complex calls than blockchain calls, uh, it, it is not feasible because a typical blockchain call uh, takes uh, maybe maybe 100 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds, and uh, it is more bandwidth and CPU bound, and modern computers, they have uh, numerous uh, cores on their CPUs. So it can be easy to parallelize. So a typical machine that you can buy from OVH, from Amazon, they can do millions of uh, such calls uh, over a day for maybe three, $400 a month. If we want to do something more interesting, like generative AI, like large uh, language models, um, similar to ChatGPT or Llama, then the equation changes completely. Uh, a typical uh, Llama LLM query takes about 10 seconds uh, on a GPU. If we were to run it on CPU, it would be closer to a minute. Uh, and if you are running it on CPU, uh, on GPU, on a graphical uh, processor unit, then yeah, it is it is uh, better. It is only 10 to 15 seconds. 
but those machines cost uh, a lot of money. You know, they start from thousand dollars and go uh, from there. So for a node runner uh, to do this, it should be worth their while, right? Uh, and I'm not mean. I don't mean professional node runners for for anyone. Uh, these chains, they are much more complex, they take longer time, they require more expensive hardware, and as such, they should be rewarded differently uh, to make it more interesting for them. And uh, that is currently not uh, possible in a uh, pocket network, and we believe that um, limits the potential of pocket network uh, and what it can do for the world. So that's why we are uh, proposing a way to reward the, you know, the chains that are more complex differently than the chains they are um, kind of baseline, which is today the blockchain uh, requests. And the way it's going to work is uh, we will implement the changes, we will bring this uh, capability, this mechanism uh, to the network. Uh, and once this ship, nothing's going to change in the network, no changes whatsoever, until later when someone comes with a proposal to run a more complex uh, chain. And then DAO is going to vote on that. Hey, for example, you know, a coder comes uh, with a proposal. Pocket network should support Llama V2, uh, 13 billion parameters. Uh, and, you know, for uh, make this interesting, the multiplier should be, I don't know, maybe 100x. Uh, what do you think? And then the DAO can decide, OK, does Llama V2 uh, make sense uh, to be hosted in pocket network? Is it good for the community? Is it good for the world? Does it, you know, is it a good thing overall to do? Yes, no. And if it is yes, OK, is undertakes reasonable uh, for that work? Uh, is it too little? Is it too much? Is it unfair? You know, is anyone trying to gain the system? Yes, no. And you know, if all these are answered, then a new chain can be allow listed and the chain can be rewarded accordingly. As I mentioned, the very first applications are generative AI uh, applications. Large language models are one of them. Uh, diffusion related systems like uh, image generators is, is another one. Uh, but it doesn't need to be limited to any of those. Uh, once we bring this capability to uh, V0, then we are opening the, the, the world. Um, so that's the basic idea. Uh, one of the concerns was, hey, if we are minting more for these um, new chains, where are they coming from? Is this new extra inflation? And um, it is our bet we didn't clarify that. Uh, the new proposal is going to clarify that. We are proposing that uh, these uh, should be burned at a higher rate. Uh, so it should be uh, net zero uh, with regards to inflation. So if we are minting 100x uh, more, we should also be burning 100x more. Uh, and that's why it shouldn't uh, cause inflation. And the second thing was, OK, you know, supply side seems to be very passionate about this. Uh, how about the demand sites? Uh, you know, the uh, portal runners, are they showing any interest for this? And the answer is yes. Uh, we talked with uh, PNI, uh, both Michael, Daniel, their team, they are supporting very, very strong uh, interest uh, in this because it opens uh, the, a, a new untapped market for them. Uh, no, it's not a new way of slicing the pie. It is growing the pie. It is adding new layers to the cake. Uh, therefore, there is strong support for this. So um, yeah, this is the idea. Please uh, let us know your questions, concerns, any feedback. Yeah, so there's a comment here. Like I, <clears throat> I think that um, the nuance to the coder proposal is that it sets the stage to add more complex services to the network, but it this proposal doesn't add any complex services to the network. Okay, so we're future proofing. Is my understanding of it? 
Um, and then there would need to be another proposal that would lay out all of the math related to whatever new service, an LLM or whatever on more complicated blockchain, um, whatever it is, um, how that would, uh, once we added that service to the network, what the math around it would essentially be. Um, and so I think jumping right to the uh, RTTM will result in overall less rewards. I don't think that's what this proposal is doing. I think this proposal is setting us up to be able to then support more complex um, services. And I'm, I'm saying I'm not saying chains like specifically because I think we just want to. There is a desire to essentially open up um, the TAM, if you will. Like right now, that is limited to um, blockchains. Um, but essentially, any um, any remote procedure call type infrastructure here that could be decentralized and could have third parties running or providing those services could could benefit, and that would increase the TAM of the overall network. Um, so stop me if I'm wrong if I if I heard you or read your proposal incorrectly, coder guys. But um, my understanding is that we're just trying to set the stage for this. We're not doing it yet. It just sets us up to be able to do it in the event that then we want to. Would that be would that be correct? Correct. Uh, good summary. Uh, thank you. I think. Um... For me, I think one of the issues with the RTTM specifically uh, as a proposal was, uh, and I think part of the reason why it was less likely to pass, there was basically two things that I saw um, where, you, where it was set up to potentially be shot down for a specific uh, concern, which was uh, one was obviously all the questions around inflation and um, and the complication that it creates for uh, inflation controls. Um, yeah, right, right now we have a very like specific uh, emission control policy in place, uh, which is um, controlling rewards uh, uh, basically by doing every week uh, an update to the RTTM um, based on the last seven days of relays. Um, and if you now have a position, uh, you're, if you now are in a world with multiple RTTMs, uh, you have to update your method there uh, if you're going to follow the same approach because you don't know that all relays, you can't just say, oh, these were the last seven days of relays. We're going to update based on that because you don't know what the distribution of those relays was uh, for each of the chains. Like uh, one week of relays, uh, like let's say you did a billion a billion average relays last week, uh, and then you do a billion average relays the next week, they may actually be worth different um, RTTMs uh, based on how many of these relays uh, those relays went to uh, to each of the different uh, chains that may have different RTTMs. Um, so that basically uh, threw in like a a complication that would need to be worked out. Um, uh, I'm not sure that just saying, oh, we're going to increase burn uh, in proportion to the increased RTTM would be a solution uh, because at this stage, uh, the burn is actually not, is not equal to RTTM anyway. Um, it's not equal to inflation anyway. Um, so I, I would need to think more about like, how that plays in, um, I, I don't know that that is actually like a silver bullet um, either. Um, ultimately, I think the economists in our community would have to work out how to enable these um, these differentiated RTTMs to coexist with emission controls. Um, but uh, and I expressed all of this in response to the proposal. But I I feel that or I felt that. Um, this is a separate decision from whether we want to enable this feature to be an option for us. So um, uh, we like we can approve having the option to have differentiated RTTMs 
uh, without actually answering the question yet of how we actually apply that feature um, and what types of economic policies we adopt. Um, so I think just the, the whole like open question about that is one of the reasons why I think people were maybe um, hesitant about this specific feature. I have to say, I think on-chain ref share as a feature, uh, I doubt that people uh, were were opposed to that in general. I think it got like shot down along alongside the RTTM feature. The other, I think, source of hesitation that I perceive is um, is basically tying it to this AI bet. Um, if people are skeptical about the feasibility of pocket serving AI in the short term, they are there because it's been tied uh, like so closely with this RTTM feature. Uh, they they may have been voting against the RTTM because they are skeptical about the feasibility of AI uh, or concerned about um, how the like paying for AI might take away from. Uh, the core uh, service that we're already providing, um, and and I felt like that was, I I felt like that was a shame to have it be tied so closely to that because while I think it would be awesome for for us to support AI in the long run, um, I also think that like the having a differentiated RTTM benefits uh, other chains as well, like that like historically we've had a hard time with like archival service uh because it's a lot more expensive than a typical service um and so we've had a case where we've had like a long tail of archival chains that haven't really been fully serviced because they're harder to justify um for node owners and and so having a differentiated rttm actually enables us to provide more of these expensive services um, and to account for those, uh, whether it's like an archival chain or something like BSC or Solana, which is a bit more uh, resource heavy, um, and it makes it more feasible for us to like like uh, fully adopt those and to offer those. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think for in my view, if if the RTTM proposal was to focus less on like the AI bet, which which is awesome to have available to us, but shouldn't be the only reason that we support purchasing RTTM. Like, and then also sort of accounts for or, or acknowledges the open questions that need to be solved about the economic policies and makes it clear that like enabling the feature doesn't mean committing to any specific economic policy and it may even lie dormant for a while until that's figured out. I think if those things are addressed, I feel like uh, the proposal itself should be more palatable to people. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, Regarding the economic, I, I have a follow-up question to Jack. Uh, regarding the economic policies, um, maybe I am underestimating the complexities, but what if we said, uh, the chains that are uh, not default RTTM, uh, they are differentiated RTTM, they are non-inflationary, and they are evaluated outside of the ARR, uh, outside of uh, any of the inflation control mechanisms. Because if each call is taking 100 pockets, which is an insane number, it is like a 10,000 10, times as before, but if they also come with 100 pocket burn, on the app side, then it is non-inflationary. Then it doesn't really uh, impact anything else. Uh, would something like this alleviate your concerns, Jack? So, um, so what you're saying basically is that we would continue doing what we're doing with all of the default chains, where we yes. are controlling the default RTTM based on their relays, and then. I guess in that case, we would be excluding any relays from that count that were attributed to the special chains. And then for those chains, Absolutely. we would be charging the gateways uh, the exact same amount as is being minted, basically. Exactly, exactly. And in this case, um, you know, not runners would be incentivized to run them as cheaply as possible, uh, you know, as long as they are feasible, of course. Uh, so that the portals are more inclined to sell them on the open market. And if 
you know, Portal is uh, capable of selling them for whatever price they want. They keep the profit. Uh, that's totally fine because Node Runners are running them for a price that is uh, feasible for them. So it's an open market. Uh, the supply and demand, they find uh, their, um, their meeting point, basically, uh, without being inflationary at all. I mean, if these special chains are being excluded from the ARR emission controls calculation, then I think that addresses the concerns that were expressed by people, including Ian in the comments here, around how mm -hmm. it would basically squeeze the average earnings for the other chains. Um, uh, if, it's, if, if you're excluding the special chains completely from that calculation, then those other chains should not be affected. Uh, it should be just as it was before. Um, and then you're setting the gateway burn to be one-to-one -one with the minting for those special chains, then you're also not creating more inflation. And basically all that's happening is that the gateways are paying for those special chains uh, in proportion to their demand for those chains. So like if there's a ton of demand for like a specific archival service, uh, then PNI or Nodis or whoever is going to pay extra for that. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a path there where um, those special chains can be enabled as like a, as an edge case um, without, without impacting on, on, on like the others. But I think like the uncertainty around these questions is, is a large part of why the proposal was rejected. Um, uh, because yeah, I, I can understand why people would be concerned that um, like introducing these expensive AI chains would basically squeeze the other like if we're if we're bundling it all together in like emission controls and we're we're having to lower the average that's going to squeeze all the like the the other default chains leading to them getting less rewards um and it's like a massive like uh uncertainty there um but if those uh if those concerns can be addressed um then it seems to me that like it should be it should be feasible but um i want to i want to see if anyone else has others uh other feedback on that specific point yeah just hearing um the conversation just uh and jack i'll follow up but um it seems like some kind of tiering model would work better than current where you're sort of like bundling the things that are uh say standard or, or lower cost with things that are higher cost and then obviously then that should also cost an application more um and and a gateway should be able to charge more for that service um but it sounds like we don't really have a tiering structure in place to be able to like do that yet um so that might be yeah i'll i'll yeah, all relays are equal on the gateway side. Uh, with the gateway fee right, per right. relay, they're charged like it's like zero point eight five dollars per mil, uh, per million relays. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, regardless of whether it's an archival relay, uh, normal relay. Uh, like yeah, yeah, and I mean, and that made that made probably made that probably made sense when the network, like you know, um, was new and first launched, and and the the thought at that time was like, oh, you've got Ethereum and a couple of Ethereum clones, they all kind of look the same. It costs relatively the same to keep the uh, the nodes uh, up and healthy, et cetera, et cetera. But like, what we're actually seeing in the industry right now is some like fairly complex new stuff coming, uh, particularly in all of the like CK places, and um, you know, a lot more like off-chain computation and just a lot more things to do to be able to like run on the chain. It's getting more complex, not less. Uh, and then like this concept of just expanding pocket beyond just servicing blockchain networks and being able to help decentralize other kinds of infrastructure is also super interesting. And then now you're in a spot where you can't really like it's apples to oranges in terms of like, you know, having to run that back end infrastructure. So it almost seems like the 
the model that we're using of like kind of like one size fits all way to think about how to charge for relays just needs to be looked at and like there's probably a way that we can get to some kind of tiering um where we kind of establish like you know these are the your, your basic tier has got your ethereum node in it and some other stuff but then there's a more complex tier and maybe above that there's even a super complex tier right and and we can price all that sort of differently and and um start to handle some of this stuff but that's super interesting to think about yeah i think um the general feeling uh that i understand from the core devs and and uh how they think about like the future of the protocol with v1 is that ultimately um the most future proof solution for all of this is going to be towards uh, moving towards compute units uh so that we're able to define this on a on a per really uh, or method type level um because like even like one call to a, an ethereum full node may be more expensive than another type of call to an ethereum full node it's not just on the level of the chain service that, that there's a difference here it's not just like archival versus full node it's sure, also sure. like right right so yeah right. I, I think that's going to be yeah yeah exactly i think that's going to be the long term and then that will also address like these other use cases of like ai and stuff because obviously even within ai you're going to have like more and less expensive types of um uh, prompts or queries or whatever um uh, but yeah to like this uh differentiated rttm is the way i look at it is it's basically the easiest way for us to implement to to, to take a step towards that future within the current architecture of v0 um uh, and to enable us to start like experimenting with like uh, other services and to to support uh, on a, on an economic level to maybe support like other services like archival um, more uh, until until that uh, ends up happening in in v one. So yeah. I hope that feedback has been helpful for you, Barris. Thank you, Jack. It is. Uh, we will uh, split them up. We will polish them up. Uh, we will bring them back to forum for more uh, feedback. Um, yeah, it's just like one thing I want to remind to everyone. Yeah, we can slice and dice. We can split the hairs as much as we want. Uh, whether we do this or not, uh, the world moves on, guys. You know, like it or not, AI is taking the world on fire. Uh, other networks are coming online and limiting ourselves to only certain type of rpc uh is just not gonna cut it uh we, we need to open it up uh i understand we you know we don't want to unnecessarily rush it and do bad things we want to be responsible but also speed matters a little bit uh, as well i will say more than a little bit so yeah we'll bring proposals let's see what happens uh thank you very much for your feedback and your support Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, love the open conversation that's happening. So, like, more of this will definitely help. Cool. Um, that pretty much wraps our agenda for this call. I uh, will just open the floor if anyone else has anything that they would like to bring up. Um, yeah. Feel free. Now's your chance. You can type it if you can't come off mute. All right, going going once, going hey, twice. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, go for it. Uh, well, I mentioned this in the chat, and I just wanted to say it out loud. Um, I do, uh, I do think that something along the lines of RTTM, uh, you know, will we'll end up with something like that because not every chain is the same, and not every service. If we if we move to other services outside of blockchain data, not every service will be the same. Um, but uh, before we just go arbitrarily changing metrics in a live mainnet where there's real money on the line, um, uh, and since uh, uh, you know at the beginning of the call and last call, um, 
you know, uh, everybody's recognizing the need for a fully fleshed out test net. I think this is something that could be experimented with in a test net if there was like a healthy number of relays that were going there so that we could, you know, tweak parameters and see what the real result is. Anyways, just my two thoughts. That's, uh, two that's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, it makes me wonder point. whether these proposals uh, should be updated also to clarify uh, in the implementation details where it talks about how it's like uh, like the re the release cycle and how um, like there is testing that, that, that takes place. Um, I wonder whether it should be clarified that like uh, part of that implementation process that will be will be that we do a full uh, a full test of the feature within testnet like uh, t changing some of the parameters for specific chains. Um, it might it might actually be good timing for us if we if we release this uh, POP for testnet maintenance. Um, uh, we can include in that POP uh, these ideas of like need, needing to be sending like a healthy amount of relays across different chains to to simulate uh, real mainnet conditions. Um, I can see there being a convergence here where we get testnet to a point that we can do proper simulations of what this looks like, um, and then we make sure that we do that before we actually uh, activate this uh, in mainnet. Yeah, it's it, it's hard. <laughs> um, sit, running simulations on test nets is never, um, unfortunately, like like test nets are terrible for that kind of um, testing scenario uh, because a you just don't have enough validators under the hood. Like there's there's like just. Yeah, I mean, we, we struggled with this at Polygon all, all the time. It was like, test nets are great to just see if the logic of your smart contract worked, but they're awful to try to do experiments with, like, uh, what happens if we just, you know, bash this thing with a massive load. Um, not so great. Uh, but that is a great call out, Ian, and, and it's something that we should think about, Jack, in that proposal. And maybe it's a different one. It's just like, how might we think about um, load type, uh, heavy transaction volume type testing? Where can it be done? If testnet's not the right place to do that, we may need to do it on some kind of devnet offline or simulate it in some way, but like um, how and who could help us with those kinds of testing and and then publish all those results and make them public like that kind of stuff would be great um yeah i'm just a little bit like uh not sure testnet can handle that kind of stuff but um but we can certainly poke on that a little bit more well you i, I just want to make sure i just want to make sure i understand understood fully what you were saying there, Mateo. Were you suggesting yeah. that a DevNet might be more feasible for some kind of simulation? Uh, perhaps, because, because like, just in my experience, like, we, we were never able to get, like, Mumbai to a spot where we could load uh, or volume test. Um, it would always be different when you deployed onto mainnet because mainnet was where all the action was and we were never able to simulate the volumes there in a way that made sense because uh, the chain was always slightly not completely synced with like what mainnet was doing might have slightly different parameters it definitely had less validators um, uh, it just yeah like those kinds of tests were not great on that uh on for that kind of an environment and what we ended up having to do is move it all like kind of offline and do it on like uh dev nets where we could control the like parameters a lot more and we could bash the hell out of it and then recreate those and like just automate it a lot quite a bit um our devops team like worked a lot on that at, at polygon um but yeah it all had a it, it, it all ended up being sort of like offline processes there wasn't uh, it, it, the the test net was not like a great place to do it um but that might be different for pocket i i I don't know. I'm just bringing in some baggage from like uh, pre previous experiences. Thank you. Uh, my comment was going to be 
there are two aspects that we want to test, right? One of them is the, the actual technical implementation. Did we do any coding mistakes? Uh, those things we have been testing uh, in our own private testnet. And of course, they will be tested in various uh, testnets, uh, also including the, uh, the one that's being run by uh, NotFleet. Absolutely, we, we don't want to cause any uh, chain holes, any crashes, any instability. Uh, that's certainly given. Uh, the second thing that once uh, that you know we want to test is the business fits. You know how does it really work in real life uh, with actual customers, with actual queries, actual chains, and actual everything. That is harder to do on the test nets uh, for various reasons. Uh, finding the actual customers only to serve them test nets uh, traffic is less than ideal. It is discouraging for them. And this thing is very costly to run. Uh, each uh, server is at least $1,000. And you probably need a few dozen of them if you are serving actual customers uh, with that data. And uh, then it becomes very, very expensive uh, very quickly. So uh, yeah, let's, let's think about this. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, but as long as we verify that you know, this thing works as it is intended, uh, I think some part of that is going to be we learn as we move uh, forwards. You know, uh, uh, grow, we'll find customers, they will have certain demands. Uh, maybe it's going to be in the form that we never thought it would be. Uh, then we will see, oh, okay, that's the part that we missed. Not in the coding error, but maybe even in the approach or, or the design. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting that feedback from Grow. They are talking with customers. Uh, I'm not getting that feedback from uh, Daniel. So as far as you know, all the brain muscle power goes, we are in the right design, in the right path. Uh, but when the rover actually hits the road with an actual customer, actual queries, then things might change. And we can only speculate so much uh, without wasting months. And blockchain world, AI world, <laughs> these all move fast. So uh, I would also be a little bit biased for action as well. So just, just my two cents. Cool. Thanks for that. Any final words? All right, then we can uh, we can wrap it here. Appreciate all the good conversation, uh, input, and you all continuing to show up. Uh, and we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, if uh, any offline feedback, you know, on anything from timing to format, et cetera, et cetera, feel free to just like uh, ping DM me directly, uh, any of that. Cool. Thank you, Mateo. Right Thanks Thank so you, Jack. Right. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for your feedback. Yep. Thanks.